Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you for joining us in another uh, series on Romans. Father, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We're just thankful for the opportunity you've given us to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit just take what's been said and filter out any error, uh, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In these uh, video series we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse and in our last study together we arrived at uh, verse 8 of chapter 3 Romans 3 uh, verse 28 therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law before I begin, let me remind you that your responsibility is to search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. I, I wrestle with the problem of teaching error every single week, and I don't want to do that. I would really rather die than teach error. You know, the assumption is then that, that I never teach error, which would be a foolish assumption. Seems to me the more logical assumption would be not to teach at all, then you'd you know, you'd have to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm safe. Well, the trouble is, the trouble with that is, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Therefore, your responsibility is to carefully investigate the scriptures to see whether these things be so. And so with that said, I'll, I'll repeat again that it is impossible to separate your faith in Christ from the faithfulness of Christ. What is it that you're doing uh, when you're exercising faith in Christ? You're trusting him that he is faithful. And so it is not, and here's the crux of the matter, it is not with the old man is not with your old creation that you trust God and we have had three chapters three chapters here that absolutely if you've been following these videos I've taken you through three chapters that absolutely clearly present the truth that in Adam there is none that is righteous no not one not one there's not one seeking God. There is not one walking in the way of truth. Misery and destruction are in their ways. There is nothing good in the flesh as far as God is concerned. Even the sacrifice of the wicked is sin. Even the worship of the wicked is sin. Folks, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Nothing that's acceptable to God. Nothing in natural man that is interested in God. It isn't natural man that accepts Christ. It isn't natural man that is seeking God. It isn't natural man that has anything to do with God. And we had three chapters of that devastation. I don't see how God could make it any more clear. He went out on a limb to get that point across. And now, in a sense, we conclude that man is justified by faith. We, we had an interesting study in one long sentence in the Word of God, a sentence that began at verse 21 and didn't end until verse 26. And in one sentence, God has made it very clear that what he has done is he has redeemed us by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That is what the text says. That's what I believe. That's what I'm going to preach we are redeemed by the faithfulness of Christ. The Greek word uh, echo is a word that means to grasp firmly or to grasp onto that fact, to that faith, hold tightly to God's faithfulness. The only faith in Christ that you have is a result of the faithfulness of Christ. I believe the reason why the translators translated it faith in Christ, or at least one of the reasons, is that more and more Pelagian and Arminian thought 
has infiltrated the Christian church. Maybe I shouldn't even say, use the word infiltrate. It's always been there. It's always been there. Even those who loudly proclaim that they are preaching grace will tell you that it's up to you to accept and believe and receive so that you, you determine whether you go to heaven or you go to hell. Hey, it makes sense. I have to admit it. That's why we call it the common sense gospel. It makes sense to the natural man that you would determine your own destiny, but that is not what this book teaches. That is Pelagian at its core. And there is something in man that's good enough that he can do something to affect his redemption, and that has infiltrated much of the modern church today. And the scriptures declare that we were totally alienated from God, and we had three chapters on that. And so to suggest that there is some carnal man out there seeking God is to fly in the face of the scriptures. There is none that seeks God, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. They are all going out of the way. They've all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. And the scriptures go on and on and on to point out the total depravity of the natural man. And I have pointed out this total depravity as we've gone through these chapters in Romans over and over and over again. Now, I'm going to address a question that I've really never stepped out and just really addressed before or mentioned before. I know the question that's on many a mind out there. Uh, Steve, how can it be that what you're saying is correct when the foundational basis of modern preaching is that man must make some contribution toward his or her redemption. That's what my, my, my parents believed. That's what my father believed. That's what, that's what my grandfather believed. That's, that's how it's been in the, the church that I was raised in. It's what they teach on every corner in America. Every church, or most, anyway. How can you be right and they be wrong? How can the majority of Christianity be wrong and what you're teaching be right? How could the Christian religious system practi practically in its entirety have gotten it wrong, the gospel wrong, the gospel? And my answer to that is simple. How could it have not? Why should it surprise us that it has not gone down the same path of error that the world religious system of Jesus' day did? What possible sense would it make if modern conservative evangelicalism taught what this text has and is revealing? Has man somehow become more enlightened over the centuries? Would not the same be true for us today as it was when our Lord was rejected and crucified by that same religious system? Folks, the religious system is the same today as it was when Jesus confronted the religious leaders of his time. It hasn't changed. The message has not changed. Only the attire. Only the the cars we drive. We're not driving around in wagons or chariots, we're driving SUVs. Modern evangelicalism for the most part has seeped itself, it's immersed itself, it's clothed itself in the self-righteous garb of the Pharisees that Jesus stood before and condemned for their inability to recognize just who he was and what he did, and they're doing that without even knowing what they're doing. It is the person and work of Christ that today goes practically unrecognized. That's what goes unrecognized. I have to fight back tears over that. 
Jesus Christ has become reduced to someone less than the God of all grace. When it comes to the matter of being born again, he has, he's been reduced to a little more than just a bystander. I mean, you know, he did his part. Now the rest is up to you. Now we must do ours. And that is not the gospel of Christ. It's not. It is not what he taught. It's not what the Holy Spirit through the writer of this epistle taught. It is, in fact, that other gospel, which is really not another, because there is only one gospel that Paul spoke about in the epistle to the Galatians. Tell me, why would the Lord, why would our Lord intend that our suffering be on some different basis or some different level than what his suffering was? Or the suffering of Paul? Or any one of those whom Christ chose to separate themselves from that world religious system to follow him? Of course Christ chose us. Of course God chose us. We didn't choose him because Christ chose them. Of course we are hated by that religious system because it first hated him. I've talked to many a minister who absolutely believes in total depravity, or at least they say they do, with one exception, and that is that one exception being the depraved man can accept Jesus Christ, and they'll tell me that with all of the religious fervor of a fiery Old Testament prophet, because that's what they truly believe, even though their Bible absolutely contradicts that fact, that non-fact, that contradicts their belief in that. What did Nicodemus say? What was Christ's response to Nicodemus? One cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. You must be born again. And I pointed out that the word must is the must of necessity. If my neighbor over here died and, and, and I said, well, he must be buried. I'm not, it doesn't, I'm not saying that I have to bury him. It's the must of necessity. What Jesus said is truth. Was he telling Nicodemus to do something? No, he was not. That's modern evangelism. The Holy Spirit blows where it wills, and you hear the sound thereof, and you don't know from whence it came or where it's going. That's the way everyone is that's born of the Spirit. The ones born from above are born by the Spirit. They were born from God. They're born by the will of God. You're no more involved in that new birth process than you were involved in your physical birth. Why do you believe, why do you think that God chose to use the analogy of birth? We didn't have any part in it. And then he declares that no man has the ability to come unto me, John 6. No man has the ability to come to me. So how can I sit before you today and preach that you have the ability to come, and if you come, you're going to heaven, and if you don't, you're going to hell? The natural man cannot hear the words of God. If you can't hear the words of God, how are you going to come to God? The natural man cannot hear my word, John chapter 10. Why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. Over a period of 30 years, hundreds of ministers have said to me, literally hundreds have said, that, you, that we become God's sheep by believing, and they don't have one verse of scripture to support that, not one. Why would you want to spend your life preaching something that you don't have any scriptural support for? The Bible says, this book says, 
If you're his sheep, you will hear. If you're not a sheep, you can't hear. Why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. He didn't tell them to believe, and, and by their believing, they would become his sheep. It's the reverse. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. They believe me. So if you believe, it's because you're a sheep. You didn't become a sheep by believing. You believe because you're a sheep. 2 Corinthians states, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. I've, I have told every pastor, every minister that I meet, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Indeed, he cannot receive them, for they are foolishness unto him, and almost without exception they say, yeah, well, yeah, but there's one exception to that, and that's accepting Christ. And, and I say, I don't see that exception, that, that exemption. Well, then why do you preach the gospel, Steve? Because God told me to. How can they hear if I don't preach? The good news is Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day from the dead. And no place in that good news is there any invitation for you to do anything. It's a declaration of the truth of the gospel. It's what God did, not what you must do. That's the gospel, and the Word of God encourages you, it comforts you, and it strengthens you. That's what that does. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God. How righteous is it? But it's an inconceivable to the human mind that we don't play some part in the redemptive process, and therefore the Pelagian thought has become very, very strong. I mean, Pelagius was quite a guy. I mean, if you asked him, did he love the Lord? You know, absolutely. Probably more than most dedicated Christians. But his teaching was as John Wesley's. There's, there's something in you that's able to receive or reject Jesus Christ. That's a lie. That's not the truth. 21 times God said he redeemed his people out of the land of Egypt, and then he said to them, choose you this day. Then he said, choose you this day, whom you will serve. I'll say that to you. I'll say that to you as redeemed people. Do I believe as a redeemed person? Absolutely. You have the choice to serve the Lord. I believe you have the choice not to serve the Lord. But, I, but that you never got that choice until you were redeemed. There's not one verse of Scripture that says that you are redeemed because you did anything, because you believed, received, accepted, repented, baptized, nothing. Nothing. Redemption is the private work of the Redeemer, and he paid a price. It, it, it is astounding that modern Christian thought says he paid that price for everybody, and some believe and some don't. So there was a whole lot of wasted work on the part of our Lord. There was nothing wasted. The scriptures declare he died in your place. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. And so strong is the thought that we cooperate in our redemption that the genitive here in the text has now become objective. And I think that's true in almost every modern translation that you get your hands on. If you, if you get Young's literal, it isn't. And there's a couple of other translations that still recognize it as a subjective identity. But folks, the light, the light is going out. The light's growing dim. We're living at a time in, with the, in which the light of the very gospel of Jesus Christ is burning out. He's got to be coming soon. It was God who chose me before I was ever born, that, it, that I might be his and stand without fault before him, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That's true of every single Christian. Do your own 
survey. Stand out on the street, stop every Christian, stop a, a thousand Christians that walk past you and ask them if they believe that they stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight, you might get a few. Yet that's the truth of every single one of you. And I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've done. You've either been made a new creation or you haven't. Your sins have either been forgiven or they haven't. You're either a saint or you're not. And since you are a saint, live like it. Live like it. That's walking worthy of your calling. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and that the, the gift includes the faith and the deliverance. God did it, totally separate from law's works. And doesn't it give you peace and rest and joy to realize that Jesus did it all? It does me. And he says he has his from every nation, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. Yeah, the Holy Spirit has vividly portrayed the, the, the ruin, the devastation that's resulted from the fall. We know that there is none righteous. No, not one. That there's none seeking after God. There are not hungry hearts out there seeking for God. There are none that are walking in his ways, none who were working for him, who loved him, and none who served him, unless by God's grace they've been born again. In almost two sentences, the Holy Spirit has presented a marvelous overview of grace, a righteousness of God separate from the law that is now made manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of Jesus Christ's finished work, because it was perfect, and because Christ is faithful in all of his house, God is just and the justifier of, the, of those who are from, out from, the word is ek in the Greek, out from the faithfulness of Christ. So we therefore conclude a man is justified by God's faithfulness separate from the works of law or from law's works. And there are not, there are not many approaches to God. There are not many different religions or theologies that lead to the same end. Christ is the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by means of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And of course, that's absolutely against political correctness. You'll be hated by the common man and the other religions if you proclaim the truths that Christ and only Christ is the only way to the one true God, since it is one God which shall justify circumcision. And once again, there's no definite article there. The essence of modern evangelism is that if the old man will accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, then the old man will become a new man. Well, that's, that's putting new wine in, in an old oil skin. And that's not biblical. That is wrong. That's why you had to be made a new creation. That's why God has nothing to do with your old man. He's crucified it. He's put it to death. The, the sin issue is settled. You're to reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin daily. You can say as Paul that it, that is, it is not I who sins, but sin which dwells in me. There's your victory. There's your liberty. Why, why are you afraid of it? Why are you afraid to embrace what God said that frees you from the bondage of legalism, from law, from despair, from doubt? I cringe when I pass a sign that, that says, God cannot possibly lead you unless you first follow him. And I think, man, what a poor, weak God they serve. You could not believe Christ 
You cannot accept Christ, come to Christ, follow Christ, or any other words you want to use unless, first of all, you've been born again by the will of God, by the faithfulness of Christ. Your faith in Christ stems from the faithfulness of Christ. And whenever we talk about faith in the Lord, our faith may stumble and fall, but His never will. Yours may be weak, his is not weak. Grasp firmly, hold tenaciously to the faithfulness of God. Contend earnestly for the faith. Someone said to me one time, Christians, Steve, they exalt Romans 8, 28. All things don't work together for the good. I didn't get this new job, and I didn't get to marry this the woman of my dreams, or whatever. They work together for your spiritual good. What, what other good is there? Never in my fondest dreams would I, would I make Romans 8, 28 say, well, I'm going to win the state lottery, or I'm going to be very wealthy and never get sick. And he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, there is no doubt I shall come forth as gold. And the same is true of you. I was never a real part of that world religious system, but I'm quite familiar with it. Man says, Lord, didn't I go to church? Didn't I read my Bible? Didn't I witness to others? Didn't I try and be as obedient as I could be? Didn't I pray as you said to pray? Didn't I forgive others? Didn't I stop doing all those things I did before I became a Christian, before I accepted you, before I believed, before I became faithful to you? Did I not become baptized several times, in fact? Was I not good enough? Did I not deserve to go to heaven? And God says, 16 times you used the word I, but not once did you mention my son, Jesus Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, we once again come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so thankful for the privilege that you've given us to feast upon your word. And we are thankful, dear Lord, that we can rest in the confidence that you'll teach us I just ask that the Holy Spirit would filter out the foolishness, opening our hearts to truth, that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.